There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another book haul. This one's kind of going to be in three parts. The first batch, which I have for you tonight, is stuff I got from Amazon and Book Depository before Book Depository stopped listing their stock on Amazon.gp. It's all the same corporation, for God's sakes, but when the pandemic erupted, they just, all of their listings disappeared. And most of what I ordered from Amazon Japan was from Book Depository and that has dried up and Amazon I'm I finally drank the politically correct Kool-Aid that so many of you drank years and years ago and got really pissed off with Amazon because of the way they're treating their employees during the coronavirus pandemic so I don't have a lot of choices living in Tokyo to get English language books but I do have some other choices so the third part of this book haul will be something that'll be a little more politically correct in terms of where I'm getting my books from but this is the politically incorrect stash and I have some books here that look pretty good the first one won't be a shock to many of you and that is Hilary Mantel's The Mirror and the Light I haven't cracked it yet it is a chunkster. I'm hearing mostly really positive reviews, a few mixed, and who knows if this coronavirus situation continues much longer, I may have to start dipping into it. Otherwise, I hadn't thought I'd get to it until later this year or even next, but I had to order it as soon as it came in. It's the third part of the Cromwell trilogy, of course, and the opening line is quite the hook. Once the Queen's head is severed, he walks away. This is the British cover, which I liked better. And this is the companion piece in the non-fiction department. The biography of Thomas Cromwell by Dermot McCullough. That Eric Carl Anderson, I think, is the one responsible for originally bringing it to my attention. This was the last copy Amazon Japan had in stock, and it was at a really good price, so I snatched it up. I don't know whether to read this first. Probably not. Probably what I'll do is I will read part three, The Mirror and the Light, then start reading the biography, and if I'm so moved, then I will start the whole trilogy over again. I'm not going to read the opening sentence, but the opening chapter is titled Ruffian, which is one of my favorite words. You may have seen this for my uh, Read Doris Happy 40th Birthday. How? 40th? Doris? She turned 30. I think it was only 30. Her birthday tag that I chose this as a book that Doris loved to try. The title is At the Mouth of the River of Bees by Kidge Johnson. And apparently the stories are somewhat fantastical. The cover is fantastic. I am probably going to do a buddy read with Joe Smith. At least the first story. If I don't like it, I will pass it on to somebody who does. This came into the house because of Doris of Aldi Books. The opening line of the opening story. I won't give you the title because that'll kind of detract from the opening line. The opening line of the first story is Amy's big trick is that she makes 26 monkeys vanish on stage. I have no idea how I heard of this book, but I did. It is a collection of stories by an African-American female writer named Danielle Evans. Before you suffocate your own fool self. Love the title. And again, I got it for a song off brand new copy off Amazon Japan. They had it in stock. The things that they have in stock or used to often would surprise and delight me so I got this for like six dollars or something and I'd never heard of Danielle Evans she lives in Washington DC and she's young that's all I need to know really on a roll with short stories so I'll look forward to giving these a try someday this was an acquisition because of Mel and Britta's read more German books 2020 reading challenge and again it was really cheap on Amazon so I snatched it up Frederick Schiller's the ghost seer Britta shook her head on Voxer. You know, you can shake your head on Voxer. I know it because she did it when I told her I got this book. I think Britta said, Sean, I liked it, but I don't think it's a Sean book. Title, Ghost Seer. I just bought it because it was like five to bucks. Frederick Von Schiller, I guess was his name. And it's about a brooding, introverted count who arrives in Venice during the carnival in order to escape from his duties and live incognito. Translated from the German by Andrew Brown. But yeah, I think it's a ghost story, so I might be passing this one along too. Now Mel was a little more positive. She said, I don't know whether you'll like it or not, but Britta said, no, Sean, no, no, no. <laughs> and I mean, Schiller was, good lord, was he even 19th century or was he 18th century? 
I don't know a darn thing about Schiller. Yeah, it was published in German in 1787, so yeah, that's what I thought. There's only one way to find out. This next one, somebody, I follow so many book bloggers on Twitter that I don't remember which one of them mentioned this, and I, again, could get a copy really affordably off Amazon. Beautiful hardcover edition that came within a day. And this is a Norwegian novel, The Waiter by Matthias Faldbakken. Again, I don't remember which book blogger was tweeting about it, but I snatched it up. The main character is a neurotic waiter working at Oslo's once most esteemed restaurant. Apparently it's seen better days by the time this novel opens. Translated from the Norwegian by Alice Menzies. The epigraph is a Norwegian proverb, a scared dog never gets fat. This is kind of a short book haul, so I'm going to share the opening paragraph from this novel. The Hills, that's the name of the restaurant. The Hills dates from a time when pigs were pigs and swine were swine. Or so the mater deed likes to say. In other words, from the mid-19th century. And here I stand, straight-backed in my waiter's uniform, just as I might have done a hundred years ago or more. People do extreme things every day. But not me. No. I wait. I aim to please. I move around the room taking orders, pouring drinks, and clearing away. At the hills, people can gorge themselves in surroundings that are rich in tradition. They should feel welcome, but not so comfortable that they forget where they are. There are a few notable exceptions. Some of the diners use the place like their own parlor. Well, that starts off rather interestingly, and I quite like that cover. Again, book bloggers on Twitter alerted me to the imminent publication of this, and I had it on my to-buy list for months before it finally came out, maybe two months ago. And that is Business as Usual by Jane Owens and Anne Stafford. So a two female novelists. It's a epistolary novel published in 1933. And illustrations, great the setup. Handheld Press is the publisher. The main character is a Edinburgh girl, but the authors, as far as I understand it, are from England. Jane Oliver was a pseudonym, and Anne Stafford was also a pseudonym, but Anne Stafford became a successful novelist later on. They both lived in Hampshire, and I just find the whole concept of this one intriguing. So the, it's the story of Hillary Fame, an Edinburgh girl fresh out of university. She's determined to support herself through her own earnings in London for a year, despite the resentment of her surgeon fiancé. That sounds like a Sean book. That's why I waited forever to snatch it up. Anyway, I'm intrigued, and I will let you know how it goes. Next up is The Collected Stories of Laurie Moore in these Attractive Every Man's Library edition. Now, Laurie Moore recently, she wrote an article for The New Yorker in which she said she found Trump's coronavirus press conferences comforting. And she got a lot of heat for that. I, um, I don't hold it against her. I don't understand. This was in the early days of his press conferences. I'm sure she must have changed her mind about that by now. I don't think she's a Trump supporter, but she did admit, which takes a lot of guts, I think, that she found his demeanor and the way that he conducted those early press conferences to be comforting. That, that doesn't make me, you know, I'm not a cancel culture warrior, but I, I, I shake my head at that, but it doesn't put me off her as an awesome writer. I didn't actually know she wrote this many stories. I've only read one in the Faber 90 series, and I remember quite liking it and not loving it. The opening story is called Agnes of Iowa, and here's the opening line. <laughs> Her mother had given her the name Agnes, believing that a good-looking woman was even more striking when her name was a homely one. <laughs> I love that. One of my great-grandmothers was named Agnes. And the last one for this book haul, this one's short, because I'm going to segment them. The next one will be some politically correct bookstore purchases. And then the final one will be a bunch of e-books that I have bought. The last one... I mean, I'm still, when there's something that's really cheap on Amazon that they have in stock and I can get the next day, I'm not adverse to buying it. If I ever move back to the West, I will take advantage of all the other book buying opportunities that are not available to me here in Tokyo. The last one for this book haul is Mikhail Sholokov's And Quiet Flows the Dawn. Lukash of Totally Pretentious and I have been planning a, to buddy read this for, I don't know, a year and a half, and it's on our 
calendars for late 2020, and I had never gotten the book. It is a classic of Soviet literature, isn't it? I don't know much about it. I believe it's set during the Russian Revolution, and it's about the Cossacks. That's all I know. I don't really want to know any more about it until I dive in with Lukash. Translated from the Russian by Stephen Gary. Just a beautifully descriptive paragraph to open. The Melikov farm was right at the end of Tatarsk village. The gate of the cattle yard opened northward towards the dawn. A steep 60-foot slope between chalky grass-grown banks, and there was the shore. A pearly drift of mussel shells, a gray broken edging of shingle, and then the steely blue rippling surface of the dawn, seething beneath the wind. To the east, beyond the willow wattle fence of the threshing floor, was the Hetman's Highway, grayish wormwood scrub, vivid brown, hoof-trodden knotgrass, a shrine standing at the fork of the road, and then the steppe, enveloped in a shifting mirage. To the south, a chalky range of hills. On the west, the street, crossing the square and running towards the Lees. And that's what I got for part one. Thanks for watching.